I really look forward in the discussion to talking about the culture change that Dr. Parker, um, Pope, uh, sorry, um, emphasized that we need to go through in order to really partner with caregivers so that they, we reduce suffering and we increase their experience of care. I love the suggestions that you added there, but now I'm going to shift to more of a public policy hat and talk about some of the spillovers of family caregiving for persons with serious illness and considerations for policy. Where is the... Okay, Dr. Schultz painted a very vivid picture, and I have, don't need to go through a lot of my background slides, but I'll just reiterate that people do not plan for their long-term care needs in the future for many reasons that are very understandable. They have other priorities. It's very expensive. So care is chosen in an emergency situation where quality is really difficult to discern. We know that caregivers are the backbone of the long-term care system. They operate in isolation, rarely having formal care in the home, even for those who are most disabled and lucky um, to eventually get help in the home. And we also know there's a lot of un unmet need for training. Sure, a lot of caregivers are doing okay, but 50% in our research shows that people report they aren't able to um, have the skills needed to do their job. We also know they're highly valued members of society. So the direct benefits of caregiving, to me primarily, are that it allows people with serious illness to remain in the home. But there are spillovers of this system of care where we rely on unpaid, untrained family members and friends to provide these Herculean tasks. I'm going to go over some of these spillovers next. So I'm relying, again, on sort of average effects in this review of the literature. Dr. Schultz mentioned some of the really subpopulations of people who are particularly prone to um, some of the adverse effects of caregiving. But I want you to think in, in these slides of sort of the average effects that we can get at in the data, longitudinal, long, kind of large population-based surveys, uh, like the Health and Retirement Study, or NHATS. So in terms of some of the spillover benefits of family caregiving, the other thing to mention is that I can't really quantify in the data the intangibles, this reward you get from caregiving, doing a job well done, having um, new skills from actually learning these really difficult tasks, things like that. But I hope we can talk about that in the discussion as well. So what we find in the empirical literature that I and others in this room have contributed to is that informal care or family caregiving does lead to reductions in care recipient utilization. So caregiving does help people remain in their home for longer by reducing nursing home entry, home health care, and reducing Medicaid and patient use. There, correspondingly, are reductions in health care costs. So I, we, people focus on these kinds of things because the public purse is really what we need to talk about when we think about policy change. And so that's why people have focused on utilization and costs. There's been less focus in terms of causal analyses trying to understand how does family caregiving directly affect care recipient outcomes. But there's some evidence that increases in self-rated health occur from having a caregiver versus not having a caregiver or some other source of care. If you think about these um, subpopulations, we can spin from sp spillover benefits to spillover costs very quickly. Um, so if a caregiver is in poor well-being, then these reductions in utilization and reductions in costs turn into increases in utilization and increases in costs. For caregivers in poor well-being, it's harder to actualize those cost savings. And so we see increases in Medicare, emergency room use, and Medicare expenditures. So it really depends on the situation, and more of our research really needs to focus on subpopulations who are particularly vulnerable. Now I want to turn to some of the spillover costs to the caregiver of being a caregiver. Um, again, somewhat repetitive, but again, thinking about what we can quantify in terms of what the public um, insurance systems may be paying for so we can get the attention of policymakers. When you compare non-intensive caregivers to intensive caregivers, informal caregiving leads to increased drug utilization, presumably to help treat depressive symptoms and the anxiety that often commonly comes with caregiving. Caregiving also leads to reductions in caregiver health status, increasing depressive symptoms in particular, and increased um, ratings of worse self-rated health. There's been a real focus on economic status, and this is a really important area to consider, I think, because of if you're really strained about your finances, there are spillovers to the quality of care that you're able to provide. And we really need to support working caregivers. There's a lot of evidence that caregivers quit work at higher rates than non-caregivers, retire early, threatening their economic security in old age, have very high out-of-pocket costs, especially in long-term long episodes of care and in ca cancer caregiving, have increased debt, have reductions in their assets, 
And then if they remain working, reduce their hours, so that reduces their income. And especially for female caregivers, there are wage reductions. We've done work that found females have substantial wage reductions, but male caregivers do not have wage penalties. So what is going on there? We really need to do think of caregiving as a female issue, even though we know there are huge contributions of males as well. But the penalties, in, certainly in economics, really do accrue to females. The other thing to point out is that if a caregiver is depressed, so again, sort of thinking about the context in individual situations, there are higher rates of absenteeism and missing work. And so that is a problem if people are trying to juggle both roles. Now I want to turn to what the expected effects of caregiver policies may be on eventual care recipient outcomes and caregiver outcomes that I've highlighted before. And I point here to some policies that have been proposed in the last three to five years, training caregivers. That's been long in, um, at areas of agency and aging, but it's really expanding these training programs. Family leave, both paid and unpaid, is expanding across states. And then stipend programs or caregiver allowances are very um, gaining traction in the Medicaid populations and also in the VA system of care. Policies are expected to affect caregiver activities directly. Things like clinical care, your skills. If you receive training, you may be able to provide higher quality of care or navigate the healthcare system better, which is very confusing to caregivers, as we've heard from testimonials earlier today. Family leave programs can maybe help coping skills and psychological activities that caregivers undergo because they don't have to juggle as much their responsibilities, at least temporarily. We know paid leave is a limited benefit, 12 weeks or so. And then when we think about stipend programs, maybe stipends allow people to bring in that extra help that is so rare to afford. Things like um, respite care services, if they're not covered by public payers, or adult day health programs, or formal health aids that would help really help alleviate this, some of the very skilled care that's required in the home, or just the pure um, quantity of care that's required. Through these activities is how we expect the caregiver policies to affect these recipient care recipient and caregiver outcomes. But I want to talk about a couple of them, both a family leave policy and a stipend program, to show you that one policy ha can have really different effects on um, caregiving quantity and also economic security of caregivers. And uh, this is a little bit hard to read, but I'll point you to this graph first. And on the vertical axis, this is work for, by my co-author, Megan Skyra, and it shows on the vertical axis the percent of working of, care, of females who were working full time after an intensive care episode, and then on the horizontal axis, it shows the percentage of females who are intensively caregiving. And what you see in the upper um, quadrant is that paid leave programs, no matter what the generosity of the benefit from twenty eight thousand dollars to unpaid leave, does a very very effective job at increasing from baseline your participation in the labor force as a female after an intensive caregiving episode but it doesn't really increase the percent of females who are intensely caregiving over time. By contrast, if you consider a caregiver allowance policy, a stipend around the $28,000 a year, that is very effective in increasing the percentage of females who are intensively caregiving, but it has a reduction from baseline in labor force participation. So it's looking across the health sector and the other sectors of the economy that we really need to consider the trade-offs in some of these policies because so many caregivers do want to remain working or have significant economic consequences if they are unable to keep working. This is just a highlight here to the left that the labor, market, the labor sector really wants to keep women in particular working for as long as possible to, because it's good for the economy and it enhances tax revenues. On the other hand, the health sector wants to keep adults with serious illness at home, not only because it reduces Medicaid costs, but it's because it's consistent with the preferences of family members and the persons with serious illness to remain at home as long as possible. And yet these are really in conflict, these two goals. So I want us to think about this moving forward when we talk about policies and the trade-offs we need to consider. Not only do we want to consider two different caregiver policies head-to-head -to, -head to think about kind of the spillover benefits and, um, and negative, positive and negative um, spillovers, but you want to also consider a caregiver-specific policy to other long-term care policies that indirectly affect caregivers. For example, here, uh, we, we've done work that found that a policy that increases private long-term care insurance coverage reduces informal care because you have that coverage, but it also has spillovers to the next generation where kids are able to work um, f from parents who have long-term care insurance. So it's not only within the generation we need to look at, but these effects on the children in, of the caregivers, children of the, of, of the people with serious illness. 
it looks like I'm out of time, but my basic message to conclude is that we really need to consider the spillovers across many different sectors of the economy and also in domains that are quantifiable, like the ones I've highlighted here, but also the ones that we know are very important to people and it's considering their experiences with care. Thank you.